Hello everyone, and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Theory Lectures. Today we're going to extend our diffusion equation adventures to solve the diffusion equation for multi-region reflected geometries. But before we do this, we'll need to introduce the concept of the neutron diffusion length. The neutron diffusion length, L, is a measure of how far neutrons will diffuse in a system before they are absorbed. The diffusion length is defined as the ratio of the diffusion coefficient to the absorption cross-section in a system, and we can show that the diffusion length also equals one-sixth times the root mean square distance, or the as the crow flies distance, that neutrons travel from birth until death. Later on, when we discuss neutron slowing down theory, the Fermi age, or tau, is analogous to the neutron diffusion length, except that it represents the crow's flight distance that neutrons travel before they slow down to some specific energy. So why do we need to define the diffusion length? Well, if we consider the neutron diffusion equation in a non-fissioning region, we see that nu sigma fission equals zero, and that our diffusion equation reduces to the Laplacian of phi minus one divided by the diffusion length squared times phi. Thus, we will have to solve this equation to determine the neutron flux distribution in a non-fissioning reflector region. Before we actually solve this equation, it is worth pointing out that the diffusion length also allows us to approximate the non-leakage probabilities for some system, which could be helpful if we plan on using the six-factor formula to estimate the system's eigenvalue. If we consider some system that's producing neutrons at a constant steady state rate, then the rate at which neutrons are produced must equal the rate at which they are lost. The only ways that neutrons can be removed from the system is if they are either absorbed by nuclei or if they leak from the system. Thus, the non-leakage probability is equivalent to the rate at which neutrons are absorbed in the system divided by the sum of the rates at which neutrons are absorbed and at which they leak. The neutron absorption rate equals sigma absorption times phi integrated over the volume of the system, and the rate of neutron leakage is described by the negative d grad squared phi term, which also equals d times the geometric buckling times phi. Thus, after we cancel out some terms and rearrange things, we see that the non-leakage probability for neutrons in a system is approximately equal to 1 divided by 1 plus the diffusion length squared times the geometric buckling. Now, let's get back to solving these diffusion equations. Here, we'll consider a 1D geometry where a slab of fissile material with thickness A is reflected on both sides by a non-fissioning reflector material with thickness B on each side. Our system will be symmetric around x equals 0, and x equals A over 2 is the boundary between the fuel and the reflector, and x equals A over 2 plus B is the outer edge of the reflector we can consider the two diffusion equations for the fuel and reflector regions, and we see that the flux in the fuel is once again given by this cosine function, whereas the flux in the reflector material is given by this hyperbolic sine term. Now, let's talk about the steps that we just skipped to get here by reviewing the boundary conditions that we impose on this system. As we discussed previously, because our system is symmetric, we know that the current at the center of our fuel region must equal zero, which eliminates the sine term from our fuel region flux. Previously, for an unreflected bare system, the inside of the cosine function contained the geometric buckling, which happened to equal the material buckling for a critical system. But now for a reflected system, we can't use the vacuum boundary condition and the extrapolated distance boundary condition to force the cosine to include a geometric buckling term. In fact, we'll see that there is no analogous version of geometric buckling for this reflected system. However, if our fuel flux is to satisfy its underlying diffusion equation expression, then this cosine term must contain the material buckling. At the outer edge of the reflector region, we can once again impose vacuum boundary conditions and assume that the flux equals zero at some extrapolated distance, which is A over two plus B tilde b tilde equals b plus two times the diffusion coefficient for the reflector region. These boundary conditions eliminate the hyperbolic cosine term from our reflector's flux solution and causes the inside of the hyperbolic sine term to have this a over two plus b tilde minus x term. 
This expression causes our reflector's flux solution to decrease as we move further into the reflector and to equal zero at the extrapolation distance. The crux to finishing our flux solution here is to introduce two additional boundary conditions, the continuity of flux and continuity of current boundary conditions. If we zoom in exactly at the interface between the fuel and the reflector materials, then we'll see that neutrons that leave the fuel go right into the reflector region, which means that exactly at the boundary that the fuel's flux solution must equal the reflector's flux, and also that the current exactly at the interface on the fuel side must equal the neutron current on the interface on the reflector side. These two boundary conditions yield two equations with quite a few unknowns. But if we take the ratio of these two equations, then the phi naught terms cancel out, leaving us with an equation that we can solve. The cross-sections, the neutron diffusion coefficients, and the diffusion length are properties of the materials and are thus known. The fuel material buckling is also known if the system is exactly critical, which is something that we'll talk about in a minute, which means that we can solve for the fuel thickness A that makes the system critical if we know the thickness of the reflector region B that surrounds the fuel. Likewise, we can solve for the amount of reflector that we need to add around a slab of fuel of known width to cause the system to be critical. If we want to finish off solving for these flux expressions, we can determine the phi naught terms through flux normalization. Once again, this process involves adjusting the phi naughts until the flux solutions give us the desired and the known fission rate in the system. We'll wrap up our material today by discussing what happens when a system is not exactly critical. In this case, our diffusion balance equation is not balanced. For a non-critical system, we will either have more neutron production or more neutron loss, which means that the two sides of our diffusion equation are not equal. And so how can we solve this equation if it's no longer true? The solution is quite simple. We introduce a scaling factor that makes the two sides equal, no matter how subcritical or supercritical our system is. The scaling factor is k-effective. k-effective, or the eigenvalue, is defined as the ratio of the rate of neutron production in a system to neutron loss, which is really just the ratio of the fission production operator F, operating on the flux, divided by the neutron loss operator M, also operating on the flux. We haven't really discussed operator notation in this course, but the very short version of this is that m equals the leakage term plus the neutron absorption term, and that the fission operator equals nu sigma fission. When these terms operate on the neutron flux, the flux is inserted inside of the brackets here, and we get the diffusion equation. So based on this definition of the eigenvalue, we can insert a 1 over k effective term next to the fission neutron production term, and we see that we arrive at a very lightly modified version of the diffusion equation. Based on the original definition for the material buckling, we can define an analogous version of the material buckling for this equation, which happens to incorporate k-effective. After we do this, we once again have a criticality condition, which is that the material buckling must equal the geometric buckling. Because of the k-effective term, this equality must hold true regardless of how supercritical or how subcritical the system is. The geometric buckling depends only on the system's geometry, so if we know the system's dimensions and its geometric buckling, then we can solve for what eigenvalue that that shape and size of material has. Before we mention that a subcritical system's geometric buckling is greater than its material buckling, without k effective in the term, and if we require that these bucklings are equal, then we see that k-effective for a subcritical system must be less than 1, which is exactly what we expect to see. This concludes our lecture for today. At this point, we have taken the diffusion equation just about as far as we can take it for systems that can be solved analytically. In the coming lectures, we will shift towards discussing how to solve the diffusion equation using finite difference computational methods.